On Rock Story. There were groups of people that were just saying, back up, back up. Concerts gone bad. Why did 11 people die at a rock concert? Crushed in the crowd. I couldn't breathe. I thought I was dying. And those who survived. I could feel their shoes, you know, just kind of grinding up against the bones of my leg. Then. Nobody takes great pride in killing anybody or hurting anybody. I don't. The grim legacy of Altamont. Somebody had to die. Plus. People do go crazy, people do snap. Woodstock 99, what really sparked the rage. Why are people ending on the snow? This is Rock Story, VH1's look at the rock and roll moments that affected a generation. Remember the rush you got when you found out your favorite band was coming to town? Finally, a chance to see them live, in person, performing the songs you couldn't get enough of. There's no doubt about it. For rock fans, going to a concert is the ultimate thrill. But unfortunately, sometimes the excitement ends in disaster. In this edition of Rock Story, a look at three concerts that were tragically upstaged by the drama that happened offstage. We'll start in Cincinnati with an event that took lives, forever changed the survivors, and shook up the entire concert industry. I couldn't breathe. I thought I was dying. <laughs> crazy. Everybody was stamping on everybody. Police officers were advising us that people were down. All of the dead were young, 15 to 22 years old. It was just impossible for us to get in through the crowd to do anything. Today in Cincinnati, stunned city officials are trying to learn what went wrong last night outside a rock concert by a British group called The Who. It was billed as one of the biggest concerts to hit Cincinnati. But what happened outside the Who's show on the night of December 3rd, 1979, has gone down as one of the most tragic events in rock history. The Who were in Cincinnati for one night, so getting tickets to that show is a pretty exciting thing. Diana Kubert was 20 years old, and one of the 18,000 fans who got a ticket to the sold-out concert. You're very lucky to have tickets to it, and, uh, you know, so friends were very envious when they found out you were going. The thought was, you know, this might be our only chance to see The Who. Dan Smith was an 18-year-old college freshman. He and his two best friends were rabid Who fans. In the weeks prior to the concert, we listened to a lot of The Who, probably every album, you know, it was uh, part of the event that we were going to, and and getting excited about going down to the concert. The show was at the Riverfront Coliseum, a private arena that hosted all the big rock bands in the 70s. Like all concerts there, most tickets were general admission. There were few assigned seats. To get a good spot in the arena, you needed to get there early. And we got there at 5 o'clock. We just felt like, you know, we could wait, you know, for a couple hours, no problem. There was a pretty good crowd standing outside. It was really no different than any other concert. So we just staked out a position at the very edge of that crowd. By and large, the crowd was not as rambunctious as many other crowds tended to be. Cincinnati police officer Dale Minkhouse was head of the security detail outside the Coliseum that night. But there was definitely a very, very strong 
feeling of uh, excitement and an anticipation. You could just sense that. It was just a happy group of people standing around waiting for the doors to open. But the frigid December wind and the looming showtime drew more and more people toward the closed doors. By 6 o'clock, it started getting tighter and tighter. And that's just like any typical concert. You know, if you wanted to turn around and walk out of it, you know, you could easily do that at that time. Within minutes, the crowd swelled again by another few hundred fans. The crowd had completely engulfed us. It was so tight that you couldn't see, you know, your feet. You couldn't really move. You couldn't look down. It got so large so quickly that we really needed to get people inside the facility as quickly as possible. At 6.30, when the doors didn't open, I started contacting the decision makers inside to find out why they hadn't opened and when they would open. I uh, was being kind of carried forward with the flow of the crowd. You were actually getting lifted up off of your feet and moved three or four feet. That pressure it just kept building and building, and there was nowhere for anyone to go. We were just stuck. At 10 till 7, Mink House got an answer from the Coliseum's security director. I was told that they couldn't open the doors until the Who group do their sound checks. I remember hearing the sound check. You could hear the music inside, and a lot of people thought that the concert had already started. There was a sense of urgency. We're missing the show. People started to push forward. You had to put your arms up in a defensive kind of fashion like this to protect your ribcage. You could clearly see the crowd very, very tightly compacted up against the, the doors. Just keep thinking, you know, well, they're gonna, you know, free this up and let us get in there. But the doors didn't open. At 7:15, Mink House rushed inside to track down the Coliseum manager and promoter. Basically, told him we need to get everything open right now. We can't wait. Open all the doors. Despite his plea, the doors stayed closed. The response was that they were limited in the number of ticket takers they had, and they couldn't use other people on the doors for fear of violating union contracts, and they do the best they could. It was getting hard to breathe, and then I had to pretty much stand on my toes to try to get air. People were just mashed together. It was a sea of people, 12,000 people, very tightly compacted. And a few times, you know, the crowd would sway. When this crowd movement would occur, it would kind of release all that heat, and a ball, like a ball of steam, would just puff out of the crowd. Few people passed out standing up. And then, I mean, you really start to panic. Just before 7:30, some of the six main doors opened. There was a cheer in the crowd, and the crowd compressed by another third. I remember screaming for people to stop pushing because it hurt. You know, it hurt a lot. There were groups of people that were just saying, you know, back up, back up. All of a sudden, you know, my body started going forward with the crowd. I was within five feet of the doorway. I started getting a little bit closer to that area right in front of the door. All of a sudden, I could feel that there was something down on the ground. I could see this pile of people. My body started going forward, but my feet was hung up on something on the ground. There was movement to the pile. And that caused me to completely fall forward and land on the concrete. When I was laying there, I remember, you know, seeing people going over top and going in through the door. I could feel, you know, their, their shoes, you know, just kind of grinding up against the bones of my legs. Someone had fallen on my head, you know, and that was the scariest moment, you know, when I couldn't breathe. I was frantically jerking my head from side to side, you know, trying to get air. I heard people say, this person is dying here. You know, I was beginning to wonder then, you know, if I really was going to get out of here. Diana went to the show with her brother and his girlfriend, but they got separated in the crush. She was now alone in the panicked crowd. When Rock Story returns, Diana's desperate plight. All I could do was think, you know, I've got to scream, I've got to scream, I've got to let them know that I'm down here. Then, there are six bands, 300,000 fans, and the Hells Angels. Well, we're going to go there to make sure that there was no, any murders going on. America 
1970. Kent State was Vietnam brought home. It was almost like a civil war, and we fought it as a war. Music was a force and was a threat. After the Beatles, people didn't talk about all you need was love anymore. Janice dying, Hendrix dying. When they left, something irreplaceable left this country. It looked like we weren't going to make it, but the human spirit, it always survives. VH1 Behind the Music, premiere episode Sunday nights at 9. This Sunday, the premiere of the music of 1970. Sponsored by Apple Computer. While thousands of Who fans struggled in front of the main doors of Cincinnati's Riverfront Coliseum, fans at the entrances on the other side of the venue comfortably walked inside. They had no idea of the life and death drama that was unfolding out front. All I could do was think, you know, I've got to scream, I've got to scream, I've got to let them know that I'm down here. After 10 minutes on the ground, Diana Kubert was pulled out of the crush and into the lobby of Riverfront Coliseum. I had no shoes on. My face was pretty bloody. My legs were in pretty bad shape. I was hurting pretty bad. About 20 feet back from the door, we did find a female victim. Her skin was blue. Just before 8, Officer Dale Minkhouse rushed the victim to the Coliseum's first aid room. I pushed on the door and it was locked. I started pounding on the door and a private security guard opened the door. I said, let us in. We've got a bad one. He said, I can't. There's no room. And at that point, he opened the door and literally every square foot of floor space uh, had a body. And it wasn't until that point that I really understood how big this event had become. Moments later, Dan Smith made it into the lobby. I remember them carrying uh, a person who was obviously deceased. And that's when I knew, you know, some, there's something going on here. We called for every life squad, every ambulance in the city. We used every resource the city had available at that point in time. Our brother and, and one of the guys from the, the medical center carried me over to one of the ambulances. Right away, they, they had to cut my clothes off because by then my body had swelled up so much that there was no way that they could remove my clothes without cutting them off. I was pretty hysterical. I was thankful, you know, that, that I was breathing, that I was alive. There were bodies laying everywhere, some that were dead, many that were injured. The scene was shocking. Bodies littered the entranceway. There was a, a news flash that there were six, seven dead uh, people at the Riverfront Coliseum at the concert. Paul Wertheimer was the public information officer for the city of Cincinnati. He got to the scene around 8.30. When I arrived, they were still removing some of the bodies. There were paramedics and others frantically doing their job. There's so much havoc at the time. There were piles of clothing, of piles of shoes that had been abandoned or had been uh, torn or ripped or taken from the people in the crowd. Unaware of what was happening outside, thousands of fans who walked in through the Coliseum's other entrances waited for the Who. The group of friends that had come in a separate set of doors, they asked me if it was raining outside because I was completely soaking wet. Now I said, no, I think something terrible happened out there. A few minutes later, The Who took the stage. I was enjoying the concert, but I didn't know the enormity of it, of it at that time. I mean, there were two worlds going on. The world inside Riverfront Coliseum, where everything was all right, and the world outside, where the situation wasn't all right. We didn't find out until <clears throat> after the show. And Bill Kerbishley, who has a manager, his face was like slate. <laughs> and he said, if you're going to do an encore, please make it brief, because something very, very serious has happened. Thousands of people were gathered waiting to get into the show. They all just started to push. That's when the problem developed. One massive wave of bodies appear to have died of trauma. Those are the grim details. When we left the concert, we're listening to the reports on the radio. That was pretty eerie. I didn't really know that someone had died until later on that evening at the hospital. And once I found out, I was shocked, you know, because then I realized, you know, what was, you know, what I tripped up on, you know, 
that, you know, because at the time, I mean, I knew that there was something on the ground, something pretty big, but I never dreamed that it, that it was a body laying there. Just before 11 o'clock, Mink House and Cincinnati's mayor held a press conference. At 7.54, we found the first bodies. It was official. 11 fans had died. Over the next 24 hours, the fans, the families, the band, and the city of Cincinnati tried to cope with what had happened. We just feel helpless at the moment. There doesn't seem to be anything we can do about last night. I just hope to hell it doesn't ever happen again. He received flowers from the who, you know, my brother who was killed. He loved the band. For Karen, it was her first concert. How many doors were there? Were there enough doors open? There's only no one reason for this happening. Just the beginning of the questions that are going to be raised about the worst incident in the history of rock and roll. The next day after the tragedy, of course, the big questions were, why did 11 people die at a rock concert? How, how did this happen? And who was responsible? They tried to blame the crowd, you know, a bunch of young people on drugs to see this rock concert, you know, and that's what caused it, you know, and, and it wasn't that at all. There was an incredible amount of misinformation. It was difficult to ferret out truth from fiction. The first reports we heard people died at the Who concert in a stampede. That didn't happen. It was not a stampede. It was a slow crush. Based on the coroner's reports, it all died from asphyxiation. I remembered a headline in the Cincinnati Enquirer. In big, bold letters, it said, all deny responsibility. There was, you know, the unanswered question you know, as to what caused it that night. Two days after the concert, Cincinnati's mayor set up a task force. Wertheimer was put in charge. We had to do something to counter this disaster. We had to find some answers. Why did they have to try to squeeze 10,000 people into four doors? That's just a completely unsafe, inhumane way of treating people. For whatever reason, you know, the Coliseum, you know, they chose to, to keep those doors closed, you know. And to me, you know, that's what, you know, caused a lot of the problems that night. No one had ever died at Riverfront Coliseum, but this wasn't the first time there were problems with a crowd waiting to get into a show. These letters, sent by concertgoers to the city council and the Coliseum's president, warn of impending disaster. All were written in the three years prior to the Who concert. There was a history of problems with the Coliseum, of abusive treatment of fans. There were complaints, not just from fans, but from parents and from adults who had gone to events there and seen how it, it had been run. There's no question in my mind that festival seeing was the root cause of the Who concert tragedy. When people buy a festival seating ticket, everybody has a perception of that perfect place in front of the stage, in front of their favorite performer. They will truly risk life and limb to get to their choice spot. It is nothing but an accident waiting to happen. On more than one occasion, Cincinnati's city council debated the problems at Riverfront Coliseum but it never took action. I remember Coliseum officials or their representatives saying, you know what, these police, they don't understand concerts. This is what the kids want. This is what rock and roll is about. We can't stop it. Three weeks after the Who concert, the city council banned festival seating. This was not a rock and roll tragedy. This was a crowd management tragedy. Shortly after the concert, the victims, families, and the injured filed a multi-million dollar civil suit against the city, the Coliseum, the promoter, and the Who. But the case never went to trial. The defendant's insurance company settled out of court for an undisclosed amount of money. None of the parties was forced to publicly take responsibility for the events that claimed 11 lives. I was disappointed that it never, you know, went to trial because I was really hoped that, you know, the truth would come out. Nobody's come forward to repent. Nobody's come forward to say, I'm sorry. And because of that, there's still a wound suffered by those concert goers who were there. It's something that will always be with me. It's a real unique thing. But it wasn't a natural disaster that we didn't have any control over. It was a preventable thing. 
It's a piece of my life that is always going to be there. It'll never go away. Uh, it's my day in infamy. I don't ever want to see anything worse than that. I think it was one of those, you know, things where you try to block it out as much as possible, you know, with something that you wish you could forget, even though you can't. Rock Story producers asked the promoter and the management from the former Riverfront Coliseum to tell their side of the story. But both parties declined Rock Story's repeated requests for an interview. Up next... This was violence for the sake of violence. Hate consumes the last party of the love generation. This was evil. And later... Three more days of peace and music go up in flames. Oh, oh my God, they're burning the whole place down. Tonight on VH1 Storytellers Week, Pete Townsend. Everything that I do seems to need a lot of explanation. Tells the stories behind his songs. This is the closest to a love song that I've ever written and managed to get the Who to perform. Be the sad man behind blue eyes. VH1 Storytellers Week, Pete Townsend. Don't get through You today are probably the first to hear about that. Tonight. Good security is important to keep any concert from going bad. In the 60s, it was a relatively common practice for the Hells Angels to keep an eye on things at shows around San Francisco. It was an informal arrangement that was usually effective. But all that changed on December 6, 1969. Hi, Someone was stabbed to death in front of the stage by a member of the Hells Angels. If you hadn't seen mindless evil before. You could see it that day. We are doing a free concert in San Francisco. When? On December 6th. In the third week of November, 1969, the Rolling Stones announced plans for a free concert. It was supposed to be the Woodstock of the West. There's big talk on the radio about it. You know, it's a big buzz. David Luce was 15 years old and living in Berkeley when he heard the news that the Stones were coming to town. Well, I remember it going back and forth between where it was going to be. You know, it's going to be here. It's going to be there. The concert was supposed to take place in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. When that didn't work out, the Stones booked another location. Then they hit a second snag. The deal fell through, I believe it was a week or so before the concert was supposed to begin. Ron Schneider was the Rolling Stones business manager at the time. The word got out that there was no place to have this event, and then this Dick Carter appeared who wanted to do a promotion for his little speedway. Organizers now had only 24 hours to get it together. The uh, night before, when it was all being done, myself and Mick and Keith took a limousine to see what was there. There were like already thousands upon thousands of kids and it was quiet, it was peaceful, it was beautiful at that time. By sunrise December 6th, a few hundred thousand fans had taken over the barren and dusty stretch of Altamont Speedway. And somehow, the mood started to change. The feeling in the crowd, the mood was unpleasant and mean right from the beginning. Writer Greil Marcus was assigned to cover Altamont for Rolling Stone magazine. There was just a sense of impatience and a sense of, you know how you feel when you're certain everything's going to go bad? When I got there, I thought it was great. <laughs> Bob Roberts was the president of the San Francisco chapter of the Hells Angels. We we're going to go there to take care of the stage and make sure that there was no any murders going on. <laughs> One of the first things that I saw that struck me was this very, very fat guy got up and took off all of his clothes. He was pretending to be in that Woodstock spirit, but he was kicking everybody around him. That's when uh, the Hells Angels first went into action. They began beating him with uh, pool cues. This was violence for the sake of violence. This was violence for pleasure. This was evil. We did the security, they asked us to do it, and I did exactly what I said I would do. I like keeping my word. There were six bands on the Altamont bill. The music started around noon. Well, I pulled out a Pittsburgh woman and they used to see. 
there was santana the flying burrito brothers jefferson airplane csny the dead and of course the stones who got to the show early that afternoon got off the helicopter security guard came over and then he starts to lead us right into the middle of the crowd out of the blue, all of a sudden, a kid came forward and punched Mick in the face. Hey, they hit Mick. Somebody hit him. To me, that was the sign of things to come. I think we were all a little bit scared. Guitarist Mick Taylor had joined the Stones just six months before Altamont. We just went there to have a good time. I mean, why would you want to go there to have a bad time? Hey. The Jefferson Airplane. Jefferson Airplane. <laughs> The Hells Angels had had way too many drugs. Grace Slick and the members of Jefferson Airplane got on the stage midway through the afternoon. They'd done our security before, and they'd done very well. But for some reason, this day was just not right. No! I see these guys in front of me with pool cues, you know, these Hells Angels, beating this guy. Co-lead singer Marty Ballin was halfway through the first song when everything went awry. The whole crowd, one must step backwards. And I just thought, this guy needs some help. And I started jumping in the fight. And then that was the last I, I heard, and boom. Hey, man, I'd like to mention that the Hells Angels just uh, smashed Marty Ballin in the face and knocked him out for a bit. You're Came talking to me, I'm going to talk to you. I'm talking to you, man. I'm talking to the people that hit my lead singer You're in the head. You're talking to my people. Right. Well, let me tell you what's happened. That was really when people began to say, when will somebody die? Their way of crowd control was to drive their bikes into the middle of the sea of people. Well, the strategy was mine. We kind of like create a little barrier so that people would say, we can't walk over the Hells Angels motorcycle to get to the stage. I actually was pushed on one of their bikes. So that provoked any one of my guys to retaliate. And one went for me. One good turn deserves another. He was like this. You get punched, you'd want to give a good punch back. The last second, he realized I was just a kid, and so he pushed me in the face, pushed me down. By late afternoon, the Grateful Dead touched down at Altamont. They were scheduled to be the fifth band in the lineup just before the Stones. But then they got word as to what was happening on and around the stage. Oh, bummer. Who's doing all the beating? Los Angeles. Los Angeles are doing beating on musicians? The dead retreated to their trailer and never took the stage, which left a two-hour gap in the show's lineup. Waiting and waiting and waiting. What's going on? What's going on? Everybody knows what's going on. I don't believe it's this long. It started getting old. People yelling. What the heck's going on? We want the stones. We want the stones. After waiting two and a half hours in the cold December air, the stones took the stage. Oh, yeah. We plugged in and we played and it seemed to be okay. They were playing brilliantly. And then you began to hear screams, which weren't isolated screams. They were waves of screams of uh, uh, uh. many, many, many voices. People started to panic. One minute everything would be calm and the music would start and then people would be pushing forward to get closer to the music. Somebody would knock over a bike, fight, stop. And that's when Mick Jagger started. They're trying to cool the situation down. Brothers and sisters, come on now. Everybody just cool out. Mick Jagger was a different kind of character than I was used to dealing with. Unfortunately, at that time, I didn't like that kind of character. Oh, babies. Baby, who's he talking to? There's so many of you. OK, baby, what do you think? Just... just be cool down the front there. Don't push around. <laughs> I can't do any more than just ask you, to beg you, just to keep it together. He was not in control. No matter how powerful a rock and roll entertainer you are, when the mob takes over, you have no control. Let's just relax. Let's just get into a groove. Come on, we can get it together. Come on. Sit down. And it was very scary and ugly and yet they were playing too well to turn away from
I remember seeing this guy in a lime green suit run towards the stage. I heard somebody say there was a gun. There's a gun. There was flurries all around. In the front. You could hear the gun firing. There was never a gunshot going off that I heard. I saw this guy being hauled to the ground. And there was this big flirt. That's when everything really stopped. Paramedics choppered the body of 18-year-old Meredith Hunter to a nearby hospital. He had been stabbed six times and beaten to death. If you move back and sit down, we can continue. The Stones saw the skirmish, but didn't see the killing, and continued to play for eight more songs. I think we all instinctively felt that if we had have stopped playing, it could have got even worse. I remember just putting the guitar down, scrambling off stage, and all of us diving into a helicopter. KSAN Radio, San Francisco. We received word that someone was stabbed to death in front of the stage by a member of the Hells Angels. My reaction was, no surprise. It's the way the day had to end. I think we all felt that we were going to get blamed for it, which uh, we did. One year after Altamont, Hell's Angel Alan Passaro was put on trial for the murder of Meredith Hunter. He was acquitted. The jury believed it was self-defense. He had to do what he had to do. I mean, nobody takes great pride in killing anybody or hurting anybody. I don't. So seeing this guy with a gun in a crowd, he had to go. But was it self-defense? According to Hunter's girlfriend, the victim was getting harassed by the Angels because she was white and he was black. Well, I don't know about that. That that didn't that didn't bother me. That. I mean, if, a, if you, as yourself, wanted to go out with a black guy, out of sight. You must think something of this black person. You think he's great. Well, nobody should down you for that. It was the worst day of my life. It really was. Life's not always pretty. No! I will never forget the ugliness of it. Just the coldness. Please, you people. And you have to hope that people learn something from it, and I'm sure they did. <laughs> it was like being caught in a play that has to have a finale. Somebody had to die. There's an age-old debate as to whether or not the Hells Angels were officially hired as security. Altamont's organizers say no, but the Angels say yes. They claim they were actually paid in beer. Coming up. The look in some people's eyes, it was barbaric. Woodstock 99, the tale of a good concert gone bad. I don't feel any remorse for what I've done. VH1 presents Diana Ross and the Supremes Return to Love Tour. com for tour dates and info. Ever since a half million fans gathered at Yasgur's farm in August of 69, pop culture has idealized the Woodstock spirit. So when the 30th anniversary edition of the festival ended in flames, many were left asking why. Was it a revolt prompted by perceived greed or just a new generation with misdirected energy? You be the judge. I wasn't preparing for Sunday night and like the events that took place then, but I don't know, in a way it didn't surprise me. People wanted something. You can only deal with so much before you just have to say, that's it, I've had it. People wanted to have some sort of frenzy. People do go crazy, people do snap. They wanted to get off on something and you know, what it was, nobody knew. In the third weekend of July, 1999, organizers of the original Woodstock Festival invited fans to roam New York for three more days of peace and music. When I think of Woodstock 69, I think of people coming together with music, love, happiness, and just a free sense of spirit. Indiana University senior Anne-Marie Spilotro and a carload of friends road trip 16 hours to get to the show. 
We were psyched. We were all very amped to go. I figured it'd be quite an experience, you know, and meet a lot of people and have some freedom and have a good time. 28-year-old David Heidi bought his $150 ticket to Woodstock back in his hometown of Boston. Little did he know that his three days of freedom would land him in jail. I made a mistake, according to the law, but I don't feel bad. Friday was intense. The sun was out. Everybody's just psyched. By Friday morning, most of the 200,000 fans had set up camp on the 50-acre complex that used to be Griffiths Air Force Base. Yeah! 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 Everything yeah! was going as planned. I feel good! I feel good! Opening acts, everything was just absolutely incredible. Well, there were some people crowd surfing with no clothes on. It was really fun, and I went to see the band Korn. What's up, what's up? And the place just exploded. Writer Matt Hendrickson covered Woodstock 99 for Rolling Stone. And that's also, though, when it, it seemed to turn a little darker. People stopped moshing and they're throwing the fist around. It was getting a really violent. And it was kind of scary. I went out halfway through their set to one of the first aid tents. There's kids dehydrated, separated shoulders, gashes on their foreheads, broken legs. It was a mash unit. By midnight, the first 12 hours of live music had ended. But for tens of thousands of Woodstockers, the party was just getting started. The things that were going on were just, they're not clubbish. This was just a free for all. You're not going to get totally naked in a club. Pretty hedonistic. You're not going to be having sex, oral sex, whatever. Anything goes and went. There's nothing going on but uh, peace and love and music inside. Saturday rolled around, hot again. It's an Air Force base. There's not a tree to be found. Uh, there have been several hundred cases of heat exhaustion. There was really nowhere to hide from the sun. We candidly never took into account that it might be, and indeed was, 100 degrees every day. Veteran concert promoter John Scher co-produced Woodstock 99. Just a miscalculation. If you were to try to go get water, which the human body needs, they were for all this 12-ounce thing, which I thought was ridiculous. There was plenty of free, potable water. Some of it was kind of remote, kind of off, off. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we didn't have them every 10 yards. So you didn't really want to walk that far to get it, so you're going to go and buy the water. Fans were allowed to bring in supplies. They also had the option of being shuttled into town. But that meant waiting on long lines and missing the show. Food was really expensive. For a pizza for one, $12, and then $4 for a drink of iced tea, that's $16. Would I like it to have been two bucks a meal? Yeah, I couldn't get a concessionaire to do that. You probably have to eat three or four of those a day to survive. That's $64. They were allowed to bring food. They just couldn't bring it in cans and bottles. Eight glasses of water. It's another $36. Yeah, it was a mistake. There shouldn't have been $4 water. Talking $96 a day. Certainly lots of people brought their own food and didn't have those same complaints. And I think they screwed us. I know they did. How many people here ever woke up one morning and just decided it wasn't one of those days and you're going to break some sh When he said that, <laughs> I mean, my first reaction was, oh, God, here we go. This is one of them days, yo. Kids obviously hadn't slept. They've been sitting there baking under the sun. People are just waiting to uncork. That came when Limp Bizkit took the stage. The crowd went crazy. Ten minutes into Limp Bizkit's set, some fans tore down the plywood protecting the electrical towers. That's some tight shit right there, that crowd surfing on the plywood. Limp Bizkit may have walked it to the edge. To some degree, I think that that's what rock and roll's about. This is one of those Saturday night, it was definitely a, a kicker. Yeah. The momentum just kept going and going. It just kept building up and building up. And then, you know, bam. Oh, yeah! The crowd was really hyped up. Yeah. Hey, yeah. The blood pressure gets going. People were getting more aggressive. I saw this one girl on someone's shoulders, totally naked. And people were assaulting her. and. Touching her breast. Some were like going along with it, and some of them were just like, Oof. Woodstock, baby! When the barrage of bands ended at midnight, thousands headed back to the all night rave. 
for many, it was another sleepless night. By Sunday, there was a lot of really tired and angry people because they had spent another sleepless night in a campground filled with sewage. Were there some toilets that were overflowing? Unquestionable. We woke up and there was, you know, shit in our tent or coming into our tent. Did the company that we hired to clean the Porta Johns do a good job? They did an awful job. It was a refugee camp. But the cleanup wasn't non existent. It's like people in war who we were living like slobs by the end of the weekend. It was getting pretty gross. It slowly took its toll on everyone. Everybody kind of had enough. At 8 o'clock on Sunday night, the Red Hot Chili Peppers took the stage. They were the last of 80 bands to play in the three-day festival. In the crowd, thousands of fans held candles given to them by the promoters of Woodstock. But the serene scene soon turned chaotic. It's uh, apocalypse now out there. Fire started one, two, three. The delay tower on fire, as you can see, it's not part of the show. It really is a problem. The fire department went and saw that bonfire and reported back to us as producers to leave it alone, that it was a ground fire and it would burn itself out. Let's back away, let the fire department do their job. It was the fire department said, don't worry about it. So we told everybody to stay away from it and, and moved on and finished the show. Chili Peppers lay their Hendrix cover, fire. As soon as it's over, they're running their limos, and boom, they're gone. Hot Chili Peppers, ladies and gentlemen. Kind of ended abruptly, and just add a little bit more fuel to the rage that had been building all weekend. People were climbing the towers and stuff, ripping it down, and they loved it. I'm going, oh my god, they're burning the whole place down. The look in some people's eyes, it was barbaric. Security was nowhere to be found at that point. We weren't prepared at that stage to deal with it quickly enough and effectively enough. It was the primo time to go nuts. They are fire to everything in here. You could just see the fires raging. What is going on? Why is this happening? We had several people on top of our vehicle ready to flip it over. Why? Are people ending on the snow? We got ATM machines getting ripped out. I was all set to pack up and leave. I had had enough. Kids were running through there, flipping over tables, stealing merchandise. Vendors were afraid for their lives. A friend of mine pointed over to the trailers, which they had all broken open, and there was just new merchandise being thrown everywhere. He said, look at that. So I was caught by it. It seemed like everybody was having fun. I jumped up one of the trucks. I threw some of the stuff out myself. There were a few learning kids that were doing it. Everybody else was sort of gaping or leaving. Co-producer Michael Lang was one of the creators of the original Woodstock. It wasn't this sort of mass, you know, uprising. I felt so good as I was doing what I was doing, giving stuff away. I attempted to take a few things. I'm not going to lie to you. And I ran into a state trooper, a woman with her big nightstick out, and she told me to get on my knees. All the fun I was having ended. Fires, looting, and the fear of riots have left the former Griffiths Air Force Base in Rome a burned out mess this morning. By sunrise Monday morning, the destruction told the story. There was close to a half a million dollars in damage. Had the fires not occurred Sunday night, the reportage would have been completely different, I think. What happened Sunday night led journalists to other things. Four days after the end of the festival, the Washington Post broke the story that the state police were investigating cases of rape on the Woodstock grounds. To have those kinds of allegations, and indeed in some cases they've been proven already, is horrific. That counteracts everything that Woodstock should stand for. That disgusted me. Crowd that size, the inmates start ruling the prison, and then there's really nothing you can do to sort of control, and it just escalates and escalates and escalates. I'll be sorry for the rest of my life that some of the things that went wrong went wrong. There's a lot of kids out there that are bored, angry, and lonely. I think a lot of people were searching for something to connect to and maybe didn't know quite how. This recklessness and the destruction is their way of getting back at their parents or society or what's keeping them down. It was just like the final reality of like, this is our generation and this is what we're going to show for it. 
and I don't feel any remorse for what I've done. I feel I regret being caught. That's all I regret. For critics who dub Woodstock profit stock, promoter Michael Lang says they got it all wrong. Lang says promoters barely broke even. Despite that and all the problems, they have not closed the door on doing another Woodstock. We'll be back with more Rock Story after this. When pliers... 